Do you understand or feel or receive love from other people? What are some examples or ways that you would say, um, I feel loved when, finish the same, I feel loved when someone or my partner or my friend or my family member, I feel loved when, come on, say it out loud. Oh, yeah, they acknowledge you have a need and you can respond to it, that they have a need and you can respond to it. That's a way of, uh, of knowing that you're loved. What else, what's another way? Somebody does something for you that you can't do for yourself. Yeah, so a kind act, an act. Yeah, it puts their love into action. Anything else? Quality, quality time, one of the love languages. Another one? Saying hello, greeting one another. The Bible talks about that. No. When they say so, when they say, I love you. I care about you. Yeah, they're communicating. Okay. Nobody said chocolate? Like, I, maybe I'm just a very shallow person, but chocolate says I love you. <laughs> uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, give that's right. Uh, but as, you know, as this grows, um, maybe it's not an act of love, <laughs> but it's meant to be an act of love. Yeah. Sorry, it could be an action, it could be a word, it could be time spent with. What are some other love languages? Getting a hug. Physical touch. Yeah. Presence. Presence. Oh, just being present. That includes listening, sitting with somebody. Oh, a present with wrapping. <laughs> with chocolate inside and coffee. Oh, okay. But both kind of presents. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so did you know that God has some love languages? And it just so happens there are five. And we have them in our DNA statement, our statement of faith and our DNA on the wall in the foyer in the, in the lobby there. And we talk about on there five ways we express our love for God. And they happen to be five of the ways that the Bible talks about us, how we corporately express our love for God. That's how we actually phrase that and frame it. Uh, in our what we call our church DNA. So we want to explore the five ways, but first a little bit of a review because we took a break last week. We had guests with us. We took a break from the This Is Us series, which is like Church 101, what it means to be a part of our church family. So I'm just going to re review just part of it. So our mission, as we state it in our DNA, is to invite and welcome those around us into life with Jesus Christ and into community with us. So God's at work. Greg prayed that. God's at work around us. Uh, we don't show up and say, hey, I'm going to do something amazing. I'm going to show someone God's love because maybe he wants to do something in their life. What we do is we cooperate with what the Holy Spirit is already doing in someone's life. He already loves them. He's already active. He's already drawing them to himself. We cooperate. How do we cooperate? By inviting and welcoming people into life with Christ and into community with us. So that's what we call our mission. Denominationally or across our region or across Canada, it's stated this way, oh God, this is a prayer, it's a vision prayer. Oh God, with all of our hearts, we long for you to come. Come transform us to be Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, mission-focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere. It's another way of stating our vision, our mission, or our purposes. So we talked about our big three here. We talk about word, prayer, and community. Those are key words for us. And so I fleshed them out a bit uh, a couple of weeks ago. When it comes to the word, we believe that hearing and obeying Jesus' voice through the reading and teaching of his word, the Bible, is very important. Because the Bible says be doers of the word. So it's the hearing and obeying part. It's not just the hearing it. It's not just the knowing it. You know, I don't spend a lot of time downloading content to your brain so that you can walk away to a Bible quiz and say, I know a lot of stuff. We all know that knowing is not doing. Knowing alone is not application or life change. So I preach for life change. That's an actual strategy of mine. My teaching and preaching on Sundays is specifically designed for you to go home with an outcome or a strategy or a way of obeying. There, you don't get a gold star for showing up on Sunday. Maybe you can give yourself a gold star. Maybe on an attendance sheet, that's, that's really nice. But 
But God's gold star for me, for you, me included, by the way, as I'm here on Sunday and walk away, the gold star is for the obeying part. The gold star is for follow through. The gold star is for, oh, I heard, I humbled myself, I received, I want life change. Holy Spirit, come and transform me. That's where the gold star happens. Okay? It's the follow through. It's the obeying. That's the book of James. James says faith without works is dead. Faith and works go together. Works demonstrate our faith. Works flesh out our faith. The Bible talks about uh, work out your salvation. That's, that's working it out. We don't work to be saved, but we work it out. We flesh it out. We live it out by obeying. Second, we talk about prayer. Word and prayer. Pray without ceasing, both personally and corporately. Two weeks ago, we had a 24-hour prayer time where we started about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, went to 2 o'clock the next day on the Monday. We wanted to raise the profile of prayer and say we need people praying every hour of the day for 24 hours. That was just a little microcosm of what could be happening every day, every week, where we're all praying for each other. We're all praying in the Spirit. We're all praying without ceasing. Prayer matters because God listens to our prayers. He hears them and he answers them. And then our third word is community. Prayer, word, community. Doing life as a community that follows the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. Now, there are many communities. Did you know there's, um, uh, there was an atheist, atheist group in, um, in Kamloops where we used to live? And they talked about getting together one time a week. Why do they want to get together? They wanted to have fellowship as atheists because they were missing out on community. <laughs> so everyone needs community, even those who don't believe in God and crave community. We're built and wired for community. Now, just because you're part of community doesn't mean it's a spiritual community. Doesn't mean you're following the teachings of Jesus. Specifically, we gather as a community at the foot of the cross, common ground, level ground, because we what we have in common is an embracing of Jesus for salvation, embracing of his teachings, the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. And in that context, we welcome God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Just like Jesus asked us to pray, our Father in heaven. And he says, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want community here like it's going to be. A little glimpse of heaven. A little glimpse of a new heaven and a new earth. And so we go hard after community. Living together. Walking together. Supporting one another. Loving one another. Today, now, we're going to get into how do we express our love for God, and we're going to talk about five areas. The first is worship. We express our love for God corporately as a church family, personally and corporately, in worship. What is worship? One way of describing it is celebrating God and his love as we glorify him in our actions and attitudes. So just like expressing our love for each other needs to come along with attitudes and actions, not just words. So as we worship God, we're celebrating him and who he is, and we glorify him in our actions and attitudes. So Matthew 4.10, Jesus puts it this way. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord of God. Serve him only. So he puts worship and service all together in a group and says, you know, serving is an act of worship. Worship him only. And then in Romans 12.1, the Apostle Paul says, offer your bodies. Give yourself to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So when you think about worship, I don't know if you see the transition slides on Sundays, but they say, let's worship God in our singing. Let's worship God in our giving. Let's worship God as we pray. Let's worship God as we read scripture. I specifically put those words in there so that we can think all of that's an act of worship. But that happens all week long. Offering our bodies. This, this could be a daily prayer of yours. Jesus, this morning, I offer you my body as a living sacrifice. I am yours. Where you say I will go, what you tell me to do, I'll do. Where you tell me to say, I'll say, I am yours. I'm a living sacrifice. See, dying only happens one time in a lifetime. Usually near the end of your life. <laughs> but before that happens, <laughs> before that happens, we have an opportunity to live. So it, it's one thing to lay down your life for God and say, oh, I would die for you. Ah, but Jesus is saying, no, live your entire life for me. That's a lifetime of being a sacrifice for God, of giving ourselves to him. And that's worship. Well, I went to a worship service. Did you? Okay. But didn't you have a worship breakfast and a worship day and a worship time at work and at school and in your community and at home? 
Bible says those are all acts of worship. They should be. They're not, it's not sacred and secular. It's not worship on Sundays, and then there's the rest of the week. 167 other hours. No, all 168 hours a week are in the category of worship. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. Whatever you do, whatever you do, eat, drink, sleep, work, study, recreation, do it all for the glory of God. So everything can be an act of worship and is encompassed in that. I was uh, directed to, in a devotional I was reading, to Webster's Dictionary, 1828. So it's a little while ago, maybe 200 years ago or so. Um, this was one of the definitions of worship. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Oh, man. That kind of that kind of puts things in perspective. To honor with ex extravagant love and extreme submission. So we're all wired to worship. Um, if you wear a jersey, a particular team, and you spend thousands of dollars to go see their games, you're bordering on worship. I'm bordering on worship if that's, you know, if I have a particular brand or a particular logo or a particular emphasis of my life where I just invest, invest, invest time and talent and treasure. Now you say, oh, come on, Pastor Dan. Don't be knocking entertainment. I'm not just picking on you, Jim. I know you watch a lot of baseball and hockey. Uh, <laughs> but can you see that where we invest is an indicator of our worship? That could be an indicator of where we invest our time, talent, and treasure. Where do we give our extravagant love? To whom or to what do we give extreme submission? Submission to their ideals, their goals. Your browser history, if you're on the internet, will indicate some things too of how much time you spend researching that actress or that actor or that ball player or that particular thing. So what's the focus of your Google searches might be a way of saying it. Because that can be an indication of where your time and talent and treasure is being invested. That's not a, that's not a guilt trip. I, I, I'm involved in all of these things too, like you. So I have to go through my Google search. I have to go through my time, talent, and treasure. Okay, where... Where do I really invest? Okay, so extravagant love, extreme worship. So what does worship look like on Sunday? It's worship, or Sunday is the day we talk most about, or use this word the most. Well, in our church, it involves usually three things. Celebration. In Psalm 122, uh, the writer says, I was glad when they said, hey, let's go to God's house. He didn't say, I was kind of worried what would happen. And when I get there, I'm usually depressed and it's not really that much fun. I, I get a beating by the pastor, and, and then I go home. No, he says, it's a celebration. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the... So in our worship services, if we want to call them that, we want to have celebration, sing songs of worship and praise to God. There's also inspiration. And we wait upon the Lord, we renew our strength. So we come to wait on God and say, God, you're our focus. Take my eyes off of the stuff around me and put it on you again. Renew my strength as I focus on you. So celebration and inspiration, and then instruction or training. Celebration, instruction, inspiration, and instruction. So Christ himself gave all of the spiritual gifts, particularly these ones, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to equip or train or prepare God's people for works of service. So another aspect of Sunday mornings, our worship service, it's not just celebrating God and singing. It's not just inspiration to get us through another week. Those are important. It's also instruction. And so we have a big chunk of our time is spent in God's word, teaching, teaching one another, hearing from one another, praying. But it's, instruction is a part of it. So worship is one of the five ways we express our love for God. It's one of the five purposes of the church. Second way we express our love for God is through fellowship. And in our statement, we say that fellowship is fulfilling our role in the body of Christ. Fulfilling our role in the body of Christ. How do we do that? Always welcoming, always loving. 1 Peter 1.22 puts it this way. Have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. Love one another deeply. Now, one of the first ways we do that is just showing up. So I'm preaching to the choir right now. You're here. Or you're watching online. Um, but being in person together, 
allows us to demonstrate our sincere love for one another. So fellowship, a big part of it is just showing up. I don't know if you heard the phrase, 90% of life is just showing up or something like that. I don't know what the number is. But in other words, just be there, be present. And um, so for us, fellowship means we gather together. The Bible says don't forsake the gathering together. In other words, um, we need to be present for one another to be able to engage in the one another's. Like, be devoted to one another, honor one another, live in harmony with one another, build up one another, accept one another, admonish, greet, care for. It goes on and on and on. There are 59 or so one another's in the New Testament. How can we possibly do them without showing up? How do we do that if we're not present for each other? How do I know how to care, how to pray for, how to welcome, how to accept, how to tolerate you? Tolerating each other requires being together. So a recent study demonstrated, you may be surprised, guess what? Post-pandemic, guess who wants to be together in church of the generations? Millennials, age 26 to 41. Gen X, age 41 to 58-ish or boomers age 58 plus. Guess which group of those three want to be present to attend a service in the flesh with other people? Anyone? Millennials. Millennials is the answer. Millennials more than significantly more. Gen X and boomers are saying, eh, get together, yeah, it's okay. This is North America wide. North America wide studies done in the last uh, six months or so. Millennials are saying, I, I, I want to be there. I want to be with real people. I want to show up. I want to get to know people. I want to be. I want to be impacted by people, and I want to impact people. I want to be there. I don't want to just watch it online. Very interesting. So fellowship involves being together in some context. And by the way, being together is not just about rows. So in church. We have rows and we have circles. There's a lot of rows on Sunday. You can see them right here. We're about to stack up the chairs and we're about to put them out so we can clean our carpet. Um, but these are rows. The rows face this way. They don't face this way. So what we like to do is whether it's alpha or a small group or a Bible study or craft circle, prayer time, we gather in a circle. We look at each other. We're with each other. We're present. And that's an act of fellowship, not just rows, but also circles. Third way we express our love for God is through discipleship. So worship, fellowship, discipleship. What does that even mean? We don't hear that word outside of church context, do we? Nobody out there talks about, yeah, I want a discipleship. What does that even mean? Um, well, it, it is unique to Jesus in the sense, and it's also unique to early, uh, the early church and Greco-Roman culture where there were rabbis or teachers, think Aristotle, Socrates, these types of people. So, uh, um, so you're, um, you're together following somebody. You're following a leader. You're sitting under their teaching. Um, so discipleship has to do with apprenticeship. That's another word for it. So discipleship is helping each other grow in maturity into the likeness of Christ. Who's our rabbi? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What are we doing? Growing to be more like him. That's a way of defining sanctification, too. If you ever heard of the san sanctification or growing, a simple way of saying it is becoming more like Jesus every day. We do that in a couple of ways. We get more of Jesus inside of us so that we start to act like him more, but we also simultaneously learn what it is to live like Jesus, as Jesus lived. So we grow in maturity, and we help each other to do this. In Matthew 28, 19 and 28, 19 and 20, we get our job description. Therefore, as you go, or technically it's going, or as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is what we call often the Great Commission, or if we're not doing it, the Great Omission. It's the Great Commission, our job description. So, Making disciples is about us inviting people to follow Jesus, baptizing them, so that's invite. Second of baptize is incorporate. In other words, we welcome people into God's family through baptism. 
and we instruct or teaching them to obey everything. So discipleship is our job description to help each other become more mature, grow in maturity in Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 puts it this way. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen a baby that, um, uh, or had a child? You know, nowadays they're always measuring everything. It, it's actually kind of sad because, oh, your baby's underweight, your baby's overweight, your baby's this, your baby's that. It's like, my baby's going to grow. It'll be okay. No offense against public health, but I know our, all of our, yeah, right? All of our daughters and daughter-in-laws, they go, I just went to the thing of follow-up, and they're telling me to cut out this and do this and do that or add this. And, and, uh, and uh, so same with calves or, or goats or kids or whatever it might be. You're always, okay, are they growing? What are the vital stats? Like, what are the, what, what's the weight? What's the this? What's the that? Growth matters for health. And that's why we try and measure these things. Now, how do we measure whether I'm growing into the likeness of Christ? How do we do that? That's a bit tricky, isn't it? Is it time spent? Is it days served or years served? Unfortunately, the people in Jesus' time who spent the most time in the Bible going to church and giving money to the church, Jesus said were the least mature people. Oh, because I've done a lot of time, man. I've been going to church for 58 years. For real. My dad used to preach. He was a missionary. We'd go places. And I've heard a lot of sermons. I've, been, I've done my time. If it was time alone, I would be a saint. Um, I am a saint because Jesus calls all of us saints in his family, but not in a Catholic church saint kind of way. <laughs> so I haven't reached that sainthood status yet. Uh, if it was time served, for sure. So Jesus is saying, no, it's not really about time. Not how long you've been a member. It's not some amazing thing that happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 80 years ago, however you old might be. It's are you growing now? Are you currently becoming more and more grace-filled, knowledge-filled? Are you following Jesus more closely, more intimately? So you can ask yourself, hmm, I wonder if in the last year I've grown a little bit more full of grace, more filled with the Holy Spirit. Is there more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit showing itself? Am I leaking out more Jesus this year than I did last year? So we might have to ask somebody else, hey, what's it like hanging around me? Do you see any more Jesus this year than last year? Be honest with me. So we, we need to find somebody around us who will speak honestly into our lives, not, nice, uh, not a nice person. A nice person will say, oh, yeah, you look so much better. You're doing so good. We don't need that sometimes. Sometimes we just need somebody to call it straight and say, well, I've had some people do that recently even say, you know, um, can I give you some input? It's like, okay. <laughs> and then I listen to it. And then I say, is there some truth in there somewhere? There might be. So a guy named Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley's son, Andy Stanley, says, ask it this way. What's it like to be on the other side of me? So I can say, what's it like being on the inside of me? Well, how I perceive me. But what if I said, what's it like for you to be on the other side of me. And we get a bit of input. We go, well, you know, you're growing to be more like Jesus, but Dan, that anger thing keeps popping up. Dan, I can see you making some progress here, but you know, that selfishness thing, you're, you're, you're trying to take care of yourself more than others and your image or whatever it might be. What's it like to be on the other side of me? We might need people around us to give us some input. Are we really growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ? Are we becoming more like Jesus? So our vision, as we state it, is we desire and purpose to be a disciple-making church, a family of those who apprentice in the way of Jesus, and who inspire and equip others to apprentice in the way of Jesus. So we could say, hey, um, I, I'm learning to become like Jesus. Um, do you want to come along with me? And we can both learn to follow Jesus together. Right? We could do that together. We're inviting people into discipleship, becoming like Jesus, apprenticeship. We're doing it. We're inviting other people. Hey, let's go do this together. You want to come with us? Let's do this. Not, 
I'm arrived. Do you want to be like me? Yeah, it didn't go over well. But, you know, and actually, I, I, I challenge you, I dare you. Talk to somebody who's not a follower of Jesus this week and say, you know Jesus, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I got to confess something to you, Joe. Um, it's actually my life's aim to become more like him. And I don't do that very well, probably, but... I wonder if you could call me on it. Like when you see me doing something and you say, Dan, that's not very Jesus-y, um, right? Have somebody who's not a Christian do that for you because they're going to notice it and then you're going to notice what they notice and it'll make you a bit more accountable. It's okay. They don't have to be like Jesus. They haven't committed themselves to doing that. You have, say to somebody, I'm really, really trying to be like Jesus. I'm not always like Jesus. I got to confess. I'm kind of failing forward, but... When, you com when you're trying to help me become a better person, think of what you know about Jesus and say, is, is Dan becoming more like that? And if I'm not, just would you say that to me? What's it like to be on the other side of me? Fourth way we express our love for God is in ministry. Using our God-given spiritual gifts to serve others on behalf of Christ. So you and I have the Holy Spirit living in us if we're followers of Christ. Not only does the fruit of the Spirit come out, like love, joy, peace, patience, those kind of things, character things, right? They start to come out as we follow Jesus, and he fills us up. But there's a second thing that comes from the Holy Spirit, and that's spiritual gifts, abilities that we didn't used to have. Supernatural special abilities could be to teach, to show compassion, right? To give, that's a spiritual gift. Did you know that? Some people make a ton of money and love to give it away. Some people don't make much money and love to give it away. That's, you know, it's a spiritual gift. It's, all a, it's a discipline for all of us to give, but it's a spiritual gift for some people who just are absolutely wildly extravagantly generous, no matter how much they have. So those are called spiritual gifts. And ministry is using them, these gifts, to serve others on behalf of Christ. So 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Gwen read it for us earlier, um, this passage. I believe it was this passage, yeah. Um, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We all have a part to play in the body of Christ. And then in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, I just read uh, some of these, but specifically in Ephesians 4, 11, these are the equipping gifts that God has given us as pastors and elders. Christ gave to equip his people so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and become mature. So, pastors, apostles, teachers, our, our gifting is designed to make you better, to make you stronger, to make you better prepared and equipped for what God is calling you into. Our calling as elders and as a pastor is not to do everything. It's to equip you to do amazing stuff that Jesus has called you into. It's equipping, it's preparing, it's teaching, it's training, it's discipling. That's primarily the role of pastors and elders. But in this area of ministry, all of us can be ministers. Matter of fact, every member is a minister. Not only is every member a minister, every task is important. Everything that is done within the body of Christ is important. You say, well, cleaning, cleaning the chairs, yeah. Emptying the garbage cans, yeah. Teaching kids, yeah. Being a hall monitor, ensuring the safety of kids and teachers, yes. Extremely important. Uh, what about putting flowers in or taking care of the lawn? Yeah. Fixing the lawnmower, yeah, that's important. What about leading worship or doing the sound? Or, yeah, all important. All of it. In the body of Christ, there's no, well, this is really important. Uh, yeah, this is not so much. No, in the body of Christ, every task is important. Not only that, every member is a 10 out of 10 in some area. Right? So the Bible talks about some of us are a mouth or an ear or a hand or a this or a that. And the, the point of that is that a hand is really good at being a hand. Right? It's not so good at being a nose. <laughs> hmm, let me, let me smell these flowers. Yeah, not so good. <laughs> so if, if you're trying to do something for which you're not gifted, you're going to say, oh, I'm not very good at this stuff. Yeah, because you're doing the wrong thing. That's not your gift. It's okay to do it. But don't feel bad, because that's, that's not where you're a 10. I'm a zero. This hand is a zero at smelling flowers, especially fake ones. By the way, this is beautiful, Ramona. Thank you so much for the fall decorations. 
But a hand isn't good at that. And a nose isn't great at picking stuff up. <laughs> Just try it, you know, put glue on your nose, you know. So that's the illustration that the Bible gives that every part of us is, 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 is we're all a part of the body of Christ. We're all different. But you are a tenant at, out of ten at something. Hmm. You say, well, I don't know what that is. We can help you with that. Because soon we're going to have a course or a workshop on discovering your spiritual gifts. And in discovering your spiritual gift, you're going to find that you have a shape. We all have a shape. Well, the shape, shape stands for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. It's not just, ooh, what is my gift? And you wait for some kind of electromagnetic thing to, no, no. Here's what you do. I remember, I remember finishing Bible college and saying to my friend, who was in seminary at the time, I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what God's calling me to do. Um, he says, oh, uh, what are your church family saying? Well, you're really good at youth ministry. I'm really good at youth ministry and working with kids in, in high school. Oh, okay. What are you passionate about? Oh, man, I just love seeing the lives of high school kids get transformed and become followers. Really? What do, you, are, do they say you're good at what you do? Yeah, yeah, they want me, they actually want to hire me at my church to do that, but I'm thinking God's calling me elsewhere or something. Well, what about your personality? Oh, yeah, I get a lot, have a lot of fun doing that too. Well, do you have any experience? Well, yeah, for the last four years I've been serving kids and families as a youth pastor. And he's like, duh, ergo. Okay, so I was waiting for this. You know, like, whoa, like God's going to somehow, and it suddenly dawned on me. Oh, I have a spiritual gift. I just listed it. I have a heart or passion. I have abilities. I have a personality. And I have experiences. Suddenly it became clear to me. Oh, that's the path I had for now during this next season. So another way of doing this is for you to test drive some things. Say, well, I don't know if I'm good with kids. Okay, we can test drive that. Give it a shot. You're not signed up for a year. Uh, let's, let's try singing or playing the piano or uh, maybe operating the computer. And then you do it a few times, you're like, you know, it's not really my thing. I'm not really good at it. I don't enjoy it. I get frustrated, and people keep looking at me wondering why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's okay. That's a test drive. So we try not to sign people up for a year of something. Do a test drive. Do a test serve somewhere in the church family, and then you get an out. We get an out. We don't have to put up your, with your bad piano playing if you're not a piano player. You try it once, and if it's really bad, then you'll know it, and we'll know it, and, and uh, we'll invite you to play something else. <laughs> um, the point is, how are you going to know what you're gifted at, what you're shaped for, unless you try? Fifth area is evangelism. Expressing our love for God through evangelism. Sharing the good news, and another way of saying that is inviting those around us into life with Jesus Christ. Evangelism is sharing the good news of the gospel with others around us. Ephesians 3.10, Paul says it this way. Your, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold or many wisdoms of God, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. See, God has chosen us as his people to communicate his love to other people around us. That's his plan A. You know what his plan B is? Doesn't have one. During this era, he has chosen you and I as his family, the church, which is chosen ones or called out ones. That's what church means in Greek. It's the people, not the building. And he's called us through the church that the wisdom of God should be made known. So people around us need to see and hear the gospel, the good news of Christ from us. Romans 10, 13 to 14 uh, Paul puts it this way. Maybe you've heard this before. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Great news. Hmm, now the question, he says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? Okay, takes believing. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard? Oh, it takes hearing to believe, to be a part of God's family, to be saved. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So, Sharing or telling happens in a lot of ways. Many people in Canada have their ears plugged right now. They're tired of hearing it. They're tired of seeing the institutional church, blah, 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 and yet not aligning 
what they say with how they live. So sharing the good news is not just telling people, you got a problem and only Jesus can fix it, which is true. Uh, but it's demonstrating God's love that he demonstrated on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And in the next verse, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. So the good news is not the condemnation part. It's true. We are all condemned. The good news is that Jesus has a solution, is the solution to our sin problem. So evangelism is our opportunity to share the good news with other people around us. Sometimes it's a very simple invitation. Usually it's telling your story. Usually it's, I was scared. Jesus has given me courage. I'm grieving. I continue to grieve. Jesus has reassured me that he is with me no matter what I'm going through. That's called a testimony. It's called you telling your story. Nobody can argue with your story. It's your story. Tell your story. What difference has Jesus made for you? Tell it. That's the beginning of evangelism. Well, we are the body of Christ. Let's act like it. That's what we're saying. The five purposes are ways of expressing our love for God, of living out the five purposes of the church as outlined in the Bible, in the New Testament. And we can live it out or act it out by celebrating God in worship, loving one another through fellowship, growing through discipleship, engaging in ministry by serving others with our gifts, and sharing the good news through evangelism. I hope you can more and more see the beauty of the church, of the body of Christ. This is what Jesus is doing. He's inviting us. Remember I said earlier, come to Jesus. He's saying, I'll give you rest. Right now, here's an invitation to come to the table, come to the place of fellowship and living out the purposes of God, expressing his love, our love for him. start on the outside the outside looking in this is where grace begins we were hungry we were thirsty with nothing left to give oh the shape that we were in and just when all hope seemed lost Love opened the door for us. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. and these thieves there's no one unwelcome here and that sin and shame that you brought with you you can leave it at the door and let mercy draw you To the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fail and been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who loved and lost another, all the chained and all the free, all who 
Come to the table We're invited to the table not just to come eat and to get. We're invited there to be contributors, to be a part of a family, to invest our time, our talent, our treasure. Jesus is the one who originally invites us and he says, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you'll have, you have no money, come. There'll be enough for you. I have everything you need. And then he says, are you tired, burned out? Jesus says, come, I'll show you how to take a roll rest. I'll give you an easy yoke and a light burden as you come. But you and I have to accept the invitation. Open that envelope and say, yes, I want to be a part of that kind of a family. So I'm asking you to join us as a family, to become part of a family. Yeah, membership is a thing. And as we go through these Sunday mornings, we invite you into membership. Not a membership of, oh, I'm joining a bunch of hypocrites, or it's more like you're a hypocrite too, and I'm a hypocrite, so let's all get together and <laughs> commiserate, let's be honest. We're not perfect, uh, but we are failing forward together. We invite you to be a part of that, and membership, we'll be exploring that a bit more in the next uh, couple of Sundays. Heavenly Father, thank you that you invited us in your family. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid the ultimate sacrifice. So our sins can be forgiven, that our shame could be gone, that our guilt could be gone, that we could be welcomed in as co-heirs with you, the Bible says, co-heirs with Christ. Wow. Sons and daughters of the King. Giving, investing, living out these five expressions of love for you, living out these five purposes that we can do corporately as a church. We need each other. And we're going to link arms together this fall. And we're going to follow you because so much is at stake. So many in our community need you. So many in our community need hope. They need healing. They need a future. And it's going to be through a unified body of Christ, living out the five purposes, that people can experience that. Make us into the people you want us to be. We commit to this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you again for being here today.